Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you found a good lunch. So this morning, uh, I think we had a great example of how physiology and biology impact uh, eating behaviors and, and the complexity of this. And I think we, we really kind of transitioned at the end of the discussion to talk about more about the impact of foods and the impact of how this is going to influence uh, humans. So what we're going to do th this afternoon is focus a little bit more on methodologies of how we can really move into those human subject trials and do things that we um, can find that will be a little bit more relative to what we're, we're interested in the food industry and the, and the foods. So uh, Rick Mattis is going to be our, our moderator for this section, and uh, he is a distinguished professor of nutrition at Purdue. Uh, and an adjunct uh, associate professor of medicine at, at Indiana University School of Medicine. And he's been affiliated, has also been affiliated with Manel Chemical Census Centers. His research focuses on areas of hunger and satiety, regulation of food intake in humans, food preferences, uh, and, and human celiac response of, and taste and smell. He, at Purdue, he's the director of Ingestive Behavior Research Center and a chair of the Biomedical and Community Human Subjects Review C Committees. Rick, and I thank all the speakers, please come up to the stage. Okay, so I guess we'll just go with two to begin with. Huh? There'll be a break between, so. Okay, well, very good, thanks very much. Um, uh, since I was given 15 minutes, um, and I figured people will be uh, sort of strolling in after lunch, uh, filtering in, I'd take advantage of an opportunity to set the stage a little bit for this session and, and hopefully transition a little bit from uh, the session before to what we're about to hear. So. Uh, there is still a debate uh, as to whether the obesity problem is primarily driven by uh, changes in energy expenditure versus energy intake. Uh, and I would argue uh, that um, we have uh, enough evidence now to probably move that debate uh, out of the mainstream and, and come down on the side of food intake is, is the primary driver, and I base that on uh, the data shown here, uh, these are uh, data from Klaus Westerchurt and John uh, Speakman, though Dale Scholler also has the data. So these are the three people that have really driven the methodology of doubly labeled water, the gold standard for measuring energy expenditure in free living individuals. And what they unanimously argue and emphatically claim is that there has in fact been no change in energy expenditure over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, I know that doesn't fit with intuition. We talk about watching too much television and sitting in front of computer screens and so on. But they make the point that by doing that, we have become heavier. So when we do move, it takes more energy to do that. Uh, and as a result, total energy intake actually hasn't changed much uh, over this span of time. Uh, moreover, if you plot energy uh, expenditure, um, I, I said, intake, sorry, expenditure over here. If you plot energy expenditure uh, relative to body mass, it turns out humans fall smack on uh, the curve for the expected level of expenditure relative to BMI. Uh, this is based on analysis of a large array of terrestrial mammals. So whatever level of expenditure uh, we have, it actually seems to be quite in line. Uh, what we're doing is not aberrant. So my main point here is that we should be talking about food intake, which is where we're going with this session. Now, that may seem comforting to limit it uh, to one side of the equation, but actually um, it's not very uh, uh, comforting because uh, if that's our focus, it would be nice if we could measure food intake reasonably well. Uh, and that just isn't the case. Uh, these are uh, some uh, recent data uh, of an analysis of all the different iterations of the Ann Haynes data. And what it shows is that in not a single one of them over the last 39 years has the majority of respondents reported an energy intake that's biologically plausible. <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, as a result, uh, the mean estimates uh, across all the surveys 
uh, in both males and females is not biologically plausible. And if you look across the different iterations, in not a single one did females report values that were plausible, and in six of the nine, males failed to report intakes that were plausible. So uh, this is not a great track record, and I think what uh, it's done is it has pushed researchers into looking for other ways to find predictors of intake or, or uh, proxy measures of intake to use uh, for, for their various studies. Uh, and to, to make that point, uh, I bring up John Blundell's uh, Satiety Cascade. This is a, a simplified version of it. Uh, but basically, he, he divides uh, the issue into three domains. So down here is the sensory appetitive behavioral domain. Inner, the intermediate is metabolism. And, and then there's uh, the neuroscience up, up on top there. And uh, to try to bridge, uh, and we didn't coordinate this at all, uh, the first session with this, let me point out um, that um, uh, Bob made the point very eloquently that, well, actually, before I get to that, let me, let me start further back historically. So, so in, in the late 50s, 60s, early 70s, uh, I would argue that the orientation of nutrition research as it related to ingestive behavior focused primarily on uh, the macronutrients and um, post-absorptive signaling systems. So there was glucostatic theory, aminostatic theory, lipostatic theory, uh, and so on. And uh, for a number of reasons, those, those uh, did not hold up. But I would argue part of the problem here was that, as Bob pointed out, these things uh, tend to uh, influence the intermeal interval. We're talking about depletion-driven motivation to initiate an eating event. Um, and so they're only dealing with half of the equation that determines how much we eat. How much we eat is a function of how much we eat, portion size, meal size, but also uh, how frequently we eat. Right? So these focused on how frequently they, we eat, but really had very little to say about how much we ate when, when we did. Uh, the last 15, 20 years, we've had a stronger focus on gut peptides, and we have learned a tremendous amount of wonderful biology. Though as uh, Tim pointed out in the discussion, it hasn't translated uh, in any uh, substantive way towards uh, therapy or public health recommendations. Uh, and I would argue part of the problem with uh, extrapolating uh, data from gut peptides to behavior is that they also only deal with half the equation. Bob pointed out these are satiation agents. They are uh, uh, signaling molecules that influence meal size, eating portion. And they don't so much influence uh, the intermeal interval or eating frequency. If we really want to get at food intake, we're going to have to start integrating both of these. And, and uh, there really hasn't been much uh, attempt uh, to do that. Uh, but, uh, so, absent that data, uh, I think researchers have turned more to uh, the behavioral side and with the advent of new imaging technologies, the neurochemistry side. Uh, the behavioral side has largely relied on questionnaires. The most common way to measure appetite is to ask people, how full are you, how hungry are you, and so on. Uh, it's become this, pretty much the standard uh, approach for evaluating this, uh, and we're going to learn uh, from our next two speakers about the potential uh, for using neuroimaging techniques to uh, address this question as well. And, and all of this research has raised important questions about, in, in terms of the topic today, uh, food intake and addiction, uh, is are there special properties of foods, whoops, special properties of foods that drive intake to a point where it exceeds uh, energy requirement? Uh, or, are, or are there consumers, uh, uh, characteristics of consumers that make them especially prone to whatever um, interoceptive or, or external stimuli they encounter? And most likely, it's the interaction between these two. And uh, so uh, this session is going to look at uh, uh, the science behind methodologies used to characterize food as uh, 
the title is as addictive, but I, somehow it seems like there should be another word there, uh, an uh, addictive substance uh, or whatever. Anyhow, um, we will begin uh, with a presentation by Dana Small, who is a professor of psychiatry at Yale Medical School, uh, though she is now spending a good deal of time as a visiting professor at the Institute of Genetics at University of Cologne. Uh, and she's also a fellow at the John B. Pierce uh, Laboratory in Connecticut. Dr. Small's research interests uh, is in uh, neurophysiology of feeding and the integration of the chemical senses, neuroimaging, dopamine, uh, addiction, motivation, psychophysics, stress, obesity, the totality of, of the, uh, the, the inputs that will regulate uh, feeding and, and how the brain, brain plays a role in that. 